Okay. So this is uh, this is an example of uh, a presentation that a student did last year, one of my favorite ones, uh, and this was on uh, three-dimensional vertical NAND flash memory. Uh, and she basically like these are the different things that I'm looking for. First, uh, she started off by dis uh, discussing an industry trend in uh, flash memory, basically how you know we need more and more storage in uh, the same amount of area because we want our hard drives to become larger and larger. So she talked about um, the standard uh, there we go, laser pointer. She started by talking about standard NAND, NAND memory. And then she talked about this new innovation that Samsung has really done uh, recently, where they have three-dimensional structures, which allows you to cram a lot more memory into the same amount of space. Then she talked about some of the benefits of this technology and, and a reference. Really, these presentations are quite short, but uh, you can talk about a lot of uh, interesting things here. So this was this slide was about the uh, the growth and the number of photos that we we all want to be able to store on our phones, the need for larger hard drives, and um, so this showed the growth outlook for NAND memory and, and solid state memory. And then the new component, I, I said I would like in your presentation that you should have something new, uh, something new related to solid state electronics. Flash memory is made up of solid state devices, made up of semiconductors. So uh, first she, she started off by defining what flash memory is. Uh, it's a type of memory that doesn't require uh, power to retain the data and uh, what it's used for. And then uh, these talk about the different process road, roadmaps. What, what are the industry trends in flash memory? She talks about how they're getting smaller and smaller basically over time. And the reason they're getting smaller is because we need a higher storage density. We need to be able to store more in the same amount of area. Uh, so this talks about the different structures of flash memory in the past and some of the newer uh, structures now uh, that Samsung is coming up with uh, at present uh, specifically. Uh, memory used to be two-dimensional, where all the transistors and, and memory logic gates were laid out in a two-dimensional fashion. Now they're becoming three-dimensional. So she talked about what the structure of some of these three-dimensional uh, memory units are. And uh, some of the challenges associated with uh, 3D memory um, and what they're doing to overcome that. So she had some details of that. So this is the part about the presentation. I know it's only uh, you know five to seven minutes, but you should be able to have some level of technical detail, something related to solid state electronics. So she was talking about the structure of the transistor in this case, and what are the challenges in making them smaller, and what are the challenges in making them three-dimensional. The challenge for you as students is to do all this in a, in a short amount of time. Okay. Uh, so then th these next few slides talked about some of the benefits of uh, why, uh, uh, you know, what's the benefits of flash memory that's uh, high density, so, and specifically some of these three-dimensional designs. Talks about reliability, power efficiency, and so on, and speed. And then references. So uh, in this particular example, she found a lot of references uh, through the website, and there was sufficient there's sufficient technical content that she was able to do all of it without uh, without having some specific journal article references. I mentioned in class before that I would like for you to look at uh, research articles and journal articles to have some specific details on there. Okay, again, it's only a five to seven minute presentation, so I'm not asking for like a, an, a dissertation defense. What I am asking for is that you have a little bit of technical content to show that you went a little bit in depth into the material so that you can teach your classmates about it. So any questions on that? Okay, good. Um, so uh, today's plan is to talk about uh, crystal structures in electronic materials. Let me make sure the recording is working here. Okay. So the plan is to get through. Uh, plan is to get through this module today, and hopefully cover a little bit more. Uh, get into the next module as well. Uh, any questions before we begin? Yes. You usually have an earpiece. Is that just you going through? Ah, uh, today I'm going to record from. Uh, I'm going to record directly from my laptop. And this semester, I'm going to try something new. Um, based on 
some of the feedback that I've gotten from other students. They, they, everyone seems to like the fact that the lectures are recorded. Oh, by the way, yes, that was the other thing I was going to show you. Uh, the lectures are recorded and they are online here. You can go to this uh, where it says lecture notes. And the bottom link here, you'll see a lecture recording. It's a YouTube playlist. Okay, and that playlist will be updated with new videos every time we have a lecture. Okay, the first two you can see are up there already. Um, and this is an, un, uh, it's an unlisted playlist, which means uh, if you just do a YouTube search for it, you most likely will not find it. Okay, but if you go to the link to the playlist through, the web, through Blackboard's website, you can bookmark it on your, um, on your phones or whatever, and you should be able to access all the lectures on here. Um, I found that YouTube is just more accessible than, than the other streaming format that we have here at Wayne State. As long as YouTube allows me to upload one gigabyte videos every to, twice a week, we'll be okay. So, so far they have. They haven't said anything. So you should be able to access that on there. The other thing is, uh, you know, I used to just have the PowerPoint files on there. This, this time, this semester, I'm going to try just screen capturing everything here. And also, uh, students were often said, like, well, we don't really capture anything on the chalkboard. So I got this nifty new laptop this uh, this summer. So I'm going to try this. If it works, we'll try, um, you know, this will be our chalkboard for the class. And all. that way, your chalkboard will be recorded also. Um, if it works, great. If not, then we'll, you know, we'll go back to the, go back to the regular chalkboard. It's all good? All right. So that way you have everything you need to uh, be able to go over, you know, go over and review. That's really what I want you all to be able to do. All right. So uh, uh, today's lecture is going to be about crystal structures and electronic materials. And uh, basically we're going to talk about the different types of uh, atomic structures and semiconductor materials. We're not going to go over all the different classes of uh, materials and atomic structures. That's something for your material science class that, uh, that some of you may have taken already. And I'd say many of you probably have. Uh, this module really focuses on uh, how crystals are arranged specifically in semiconductors. We're going to talk about the different types of uh, crystal lattices that are present in uh, semiconductor devices, uh, specifically the diamond lattice and the, the uh, uh, zinc blend lattice. We'll talk about the different crystal structures of semiconductors, and then we'll talk about how, um, how these things are actually manufactured. So these are the different types of solids. There's three types, crystalline, amorphous, and polycrystalline. Have, have any of you seen these, uh, these three definitions before? OK. Uh, what's an example of a, um, a crystalline material? Something that has a repeating arrangement of atoms. So we're, we're looking here on the left. One of the types of materials uh, that you can have is a crystalline material. Salt. Salt is a good example. Right? Anything that, uh, yeah, diamond is another good example. I heard that as well. So what defines a crystalline material? The atomic structure is a repeating arrangement. Okay, if you look in there, the atomic structure, the spaces between the atoms, there's a fixed spacing. And that spacing is consistent throughout the entire lattice. Okay, it's a repeating crystal structure. Now, what's one of the properties of salt and diamond? If you were to break a piece of salt, if you were to break a piece of diamond, what would happen? It's a perfect cube, right? Uh, so salt tends to stay in a perfect cube, right? In the case of diamond, you end up breaking it along certain crystal planes, right? When it breaks, it doesn't break randomly. It actually breaks along certain crystal planes. This is because the atomic structure itself has a repeating, uh, 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 repeating cr uh, structure. Okay, well, and this is called the unit cell. We'll talk about that in a second. But the definition basically is that a crystalline material has a repeating, uh, predictable pattern of atomic arrangement within it. So the uh, the opposite of that is an amorphous material. So in an amorphous material, the atomic structure is completely random. Okay, they have different spacings among them. Uh, they have uh, so the the properties of the material. Um, 
are also random. Does this make sense? <coughs> Uh, one of the things that you may have learned about in material science, and one of the one of the fundamental principles, I guess you could say, is that the the crystal structure of a material, the atomic arrangement of a material, determines its properties. <coughs> and those properties could be mechanical properties, like we were just talking about, how how a material breaks, whether it's brittle or not brittle. Um, it can also determine its electronic properties. And so this class, of course, will focus on how the crystal structures ultimately determine the electronic properties of a material. Uh, what's an example of an amorphous material? Steel. <coughs> sure. Steel can have a random arrangement of atoms. What are some of the pro corresponding properties of steel? It's conductive. It's conductive. Yes? Uh, yeah. Sensitive to oxygen. Yes, the chemical properties. How about mechanical properties? It's malleable, yeah. Like, a, um, I don't want to quite draw any uh, relations between crystal structures and metals and insulators yet. We'll get to that in a little bit. But just uh, just so you have an idea, like uh, of mechanical properties, an amorphous material like metal, where the the atoms can rearrange in in random fashion, uh, me corresponding mechanical property is that it is uh, malleable and and ductile. You can bend it in various forms, right? Uh, compared to a crystalline material, crystalline material always, if you try to bend it, it breaks along one of the crystal planes. So that's an example of atomic structure determining mechanical properties. Uh, another amorphous material, which you may not think of as amorphous, is, is glass. Okay, glass, yes, is, is brittle in the sense if we drop it, it breaks. But remember when you heat up glass, when you heat up glass, it flows like a liquid, right? And it can be formed into any any one of these like beautiful shapes. You've seen glass blowing, you've seen glass blowing, you know that glass can be made into any one of these like beautiful shapes like vases and, and other type things. So amorphous materials, you, you can form like different types of shapes with them. The, the material flows more. Okay, so the, because they have a random arrangement of atoms. Uh, a polycrystal material is something in between. Okay, this is where you have uh, regions of crystallinity. You can see here that um, you have these crystalline regions here, um, and then you have other crystalline regions here, and they're sort of connected together by these things called grain boundaries. Okay, so the definition of polycrystalline is that it has regions of crystallinity separated by these things called grain boundaries. You can imagine that a polycrystalline material will have properties, some aspects of crystalline uh, materials, some properties similar to amorphous materials. There's something in between the two. Wouldn't most metals fall into that category? A polycrystalline? But the question is, would most metals fall into the polycrystalline category? Not necessarily. We're talking if, we're, if you're talking about metals like gold and steel, that kind of thing, those are not uh, polycrystalline materials. They're more amorphous materials. Uh, an example of a polycrystalline material is something like silicon. The silicon can behave as a conductor in some cases, and it can behave as an insulator in others. But we'll get into that. Uh, so on the right here, uh, you can see that we have um, uh, uh, a crystalline and amorphous silicon. Now, uh, one point I want to bring up is that a certain type of material, for example, silicon, can exist in multiple forms. Okay, metal is normally uh, uh, has an amorphous structure, but silicon can actually exist in an amorphous state. It can also exist in a crystalline state. Okay, um, this is this is common of other types of materials too. Let me give you an ex example of another column four element. Silicon is a carbon uh, a column four element. So is carbon. Uh, when uh, carbon is amorphous, what do we call it? If when when we have carbon atoms that are just in some sort of random arrangement, random structure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it can be soot. Right? It could be graphite. I mean, that's all carbon, right? But it's not in a repeating crystal structure. It's just in a more or less a random arrangement. Graphite. Remember I told you all about the experiment with graphene and how they created graphene mm -hmm. by putting scotch tape on a uh, on a on the tip of a, a lead or a graphite pencil and they they transferred the graphene to another film. Well, that's actually an example of a polycrystalline material. There were regions of crystalline. There were crystalline sheets of graphene on the tip of the pencil, right? 
and they transferred like some of those sheets onto uh, another substrate. So that was an example of sort of a polycrystalline structure. In a lot of cases, in the case of soot, carbon is in a uh, completely random structure, amorphous structure. What is an example of carbon? What, what, what do we call carbon when it's in a purely crystalline structure? Diamond. Diamond. That's right. And, uh, you know, diamond can form naturally. You know, it takes like, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of years to form, I think. Uh, it can also be created in the lab nowadays using uh, uh, chemical vapor deposition and other type of techniques. But it has, it's a very repeating structure of carbon. You can know that diamond has very different properties than, than soot. Right? Just because it's the same atoms, but just in a different atomic structure. So with silicon, silicon can also exist in amorphous form. It can also exist in a crystalline form. Now this is an example. Um, this is a what's called a TEM image. Uh, does anyone know what TEM stands for? Very good. Yes. Uh, a tunneling electron microscope is called, there's another form of it too called transmission electron microscope. This is where you take electron beams, and I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but you can take electron beams and shoot them through a very thin sheet of the material. So in this case, we have a very thin sheet of silicon, and we shoot a high energy electron beam through there, and uh, there's a detector on the opposite side. So we can actually image things down to atomic resolutions with a transmission electron microscope. It is a very big and expensive instrument. We do have one here at Wayne State's chemistry department. They have them other, you know, they have them in a lot of other big research facilities around the world. Um, and they are, they take up a good chunk of a room, but they have a very high resolution. And uh, uh, when we're dealing with semiconductors, a lot of times TEMs and those types of high resolution microscopes are used to study the actual, to look at the actual crystal structure of a material, to look for defects and things like that. So this is an example of crystal and silicon that you see here down at the bottom. And those dots that you see here, amazingly, those are actually individual atoms. The TEM can actually see the, the general shape of individual atoms, which is quite amazing. It has resolution on the, uh, on the scale of angstroms. So this is crystalline uh, silicon down here. You can see that we have a repeating arrangement of atoms. And then up here, you can see amorphous silicon. In amorphous silicon, we have a rather a random arrangement of atoms. Okay. Now, um, uh, what do you think crystal and silicon would have in terms of advantages? What kind of advantages might crystal and silicon have over amorphous? Sure. Sorry? Higher melting point. Higher melting point? Um, good question. I, I'm not quite sure which one has a higher melting point. Um, I was thinking of something else in terms of properties. Yes, exactly, exactly. More uniform properties. So if the dogma here is that the atomic structure determines its properties, then a repeating and predictable atomic structure will result in repeating uh, and predictable electronic properties. Okay. So uh, one of the reasons crystalline silicon is used in electronics is so that we will have repeatable properties uh, throughout the silicon chip. Okay, if we look at the uh, com a computer chip, right? A computer chip is, you know, might be uh, a few centimeters by a few centimeters. That computer chip, as we talked about in class last time, may have uh, more than a billion transistors on it. If some of those transistors malfunction, well, that part of the microprocessor malfunctions, right? So imagine what a nightmare would be if this one part of your semiconductor chip has different properties than another part of your semiconductor chip. It would be very difficult to get a microprocessor with a billion transistors on it and have all of them be reliable and have similar uniform properties. All right. This is one of the reasons why um, we use crystal and silicon and why when we make these types of cr crystal and silicon wafers, they have to be done in a very, very controlled manner. And one of the things that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that our ability to make very, very crystalline silicon has improved so that we can get very reliable electronic chips uh, at the end. Uh, can anyone think of advantages of amorphous silicon up here? 
you may or may not know this. So, um, but just take a guess. It will have some more. It it does have a different uh, mechanical property. Yes. Is it glass? No. 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 Not cool. You can mold it. Uh, it's still a hard material, so you can't quite mold it. Um, but it's, it, I'll say it's, it's just easier to manufacture. Amorphous silicon and polycrystalline silicon are easier to manufacture than crystalline silicon down here. So one of the places where amorphous silicon is often used is in uh, solar cells. With solar cells, you can still get uh, a decent efficiency by, uh, without having uh, crystalline silicon. And with solar cells, one of the big things is how can we make that thing as cheap as possible while still maintaining efficiency. In the case of microprocessors, you have to think about reliability, that all the transistors on the device are working. Okay, if you have a huge solar cell and one, one part of the solar cell is not producing as much electricity as the other part, it's not the end of the world. It might reduce the efficiency a little bit, but there's, there's not going to be a, a catastrophic malfunction. Right? But with Microprocessors, when we have a billion transistors on the chip and they all have to be working, you have to make sure that you use material that is uh, very repeatable. So that's why crystalline silicon is used. Just a little bit of background on unit cells. <clears throat> so crystalline materials are typically made of repeating structures called unit cells. Uh, there's three basic types of unit cells in crystalline materials. Um, and these are uh, shown below here. So there's a simple cubic, the body-centered cubic, and the face-centered cubic. Uh, so when we talk about these types of unit cells, if I can draw like a sort of a two-dimensional uh, format here. So this, is, so this is a simple cubic unit cell. Actually, I'll draw it in 3D. Can everyone see this? Okay. So a simple cubic cell really looks just like a cube. If you imagine a cube with eight, um, eight atoms, one at each of the vert vertices. I haven't drawn all eight. Um, the, well, let me just add. Let me add the middle ones in here. Okay. Now we have all eight. Now this structure just repeats itself. So the next unit cell would be here like this. All right, and so on. There's, there's another unit cell here. There's another unit cell here. There's another unit cell here, and so on, right? Uh, how many... Uh, how many unit cells is the middle unit cell surrounded by? Six. Six. Why is it six? Six faces to the cube. Exactly. Now another question for you. This atom that I've drawn right here, yeah, I'll circle it in red here. This atom right here, how many unit cells is that shared between? Eight. Why is it eight back there? Four on the bottom and another four stacked on top. Exactly. All right. So think about that for a minute. Um, you see how uh, there would be, uh, let's see, there would be four unit cells here. All right. So th let's say uh, this atom is shared by four unit cells here, and then you stack another four unit cells on top of it. So each corner atom is shared by eight different unit cells. Okay. So it, it'll, you know, other unit types of unit cells will be slightly different. But this is the basic one. Is the uh, simple cubic here? The body-centered cubic is like the simple cubic, except it has an additional atom in the middle of it. So if we think of this in terms of atomic density, which one of these types of unit cells would have a larger atomic density? Atomic density is defined in atoms per centimeter cubed. 
How many atoms do we have in per centimeter cubed? Yes. Uh, that's correct. The face center cube. Yeah, I haven't mentioned this one yet, but yes, that's right. The face center cubic one would be the most dense because it has the most atoms per unit cell. Exactly. Another question. In the face centered cubic cells, how many, um, one of these side atoms here, the one in the face, how many unit cells share that? Two. Two. Exactly. Exactly. Good. So, uh, um, you can look at three-dimensional uh, models of some of these lattices. You know, I think in the old school type classes, what they would do is, um, ah, how do I turn this off? I have to install this plugin. Oh, that's going to take a while. Never mind. Uh, what I would uh, encourage you to do is uh, you can go to this web page and they have different models of various types of unit cells and you can actually rotate them around in 3D if you have the Java plugin. It's very easy to install. Uh, you know, before we used to have like these stick and ball models. I don't know if you may have used some of those in your chemistry classes. But now with, you know, with computer graphics, it just makes things a lot easier to, that you can rotate them and see what they look like in 3D. It just makes things a little bit easier. Uh, one more point of note here is you have this this thing called um, uh, the lattice constant A. So that's this thing here. The lattice constant is um, the size of the unit cell. So in the case of the simple cubic, body-centered cubic, the A is simply just the length of one of the edges of the unit cell. Okay. <clears throat> so different semiconductor materials. Uh, so we talked about different types of unit cells. Let's talk about, you know, what semiconductors are made of. Uh, by the way, the, the definition of a semiconductor, like we talked about in last time in class, something between an insulator and and a conductor. Okay. Sometimes a semiconductor conducts electricity, and other times it does not elect conduct le electricity. Sometimes it behaves as a conductor, and in other cases it behaves as an insulator. We'll talk about what causes it to um, be an insulator in some cases and a conductor in other cases. But that's, like we said last time, that's a very important property because it allows you to make electronic switches. Now, a switch is something that conducts sometimes and then it doesn't conduct other times, right? The electronic switch is a, the central building block of any type, any type of computational unit. Anything that can perform math computations, it's a basic building block of microprocessors. So that's why... The, the fact that a semiconductor can conduct sometimes and not others is, is an essential property uh, why it's very important as a material. So now talking about different semiconductor materials, we have, um, uh, excuse me, uh, the different types of semiconductor materials come from different parts of the periodic table. So we can put our chemistry hats on for a second and go back to the periodic table from which uh, all material science uh, arguments come from. Uh, so elemental semiconductors consist of column four elements only, and there are these things called binary semiconductors, which are combinations of column three and column five elements. And sometimes you have binary semiconductors, which are combinations of column two and column six elements. So if we start with the elemental semiconductors, this is the most common kind. Okay, the elemental semiconductors are used in transistors and other integrated circuits. It's used in infrared detectors and in, in various types of nuclear detectors. The elemental semiconductors are the most common type of semiconductor device. Silicon is an example of an elemental semiconductor. So the elemental semiconductor consists of a column four element. So if we look at column four of, of the periodic table, this is what we find. Now, this is just a selected portion of the periodic table, but you get the idea here. Under column four, we have uh, carbon, we have silicon, and we have germanium. Okay. Uh, if we talk about um, the, the chemical structure of a, co a column four element, we can kind of go back to our uh, chemistry and uh, talk about dot diagrams. How many of you remember dot diagrams from chemistry? Okay. All right. Good. So 
let's take silicon for example, the most common type of semiconductor material. All right, so silicon is a column four element, so it has four electrons on its outer shell. Okay, so we can draw four um, we can draw four atoms around it like this. This is a dot diagram. So for those of you who uh, don't remember about this, you, you have the what I've drawn in the middle is a SI, so that's sort of like the the nucleus. Okay, we're not drawing out all the uh, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and we're not drawing out all the electrons either. All we are is draw, we're drawing out four electrons because those are four electrons in the outer shell. It's a column four element that means it has four electrons in its outer shell. Okay, so four electrons in outer shell. Now, um, uh, how many electrons does an atom like to have in its outer shell? Yes, and at least for the types of atoms that we're talking about, we assume that uh, there are eight. It likes to have eight atoms in its outer shell. So let's put that down. Prefers to have eight atoms or eight electrons. Sorry, eight electrons in outer shell. How can it get eight atoms in its outer shell? It forms bonds. That's correct. So these dot diagrams are used to show the chemical reactivity of atoms. What types of bonds can it form? Covalent, Covalent is one of them. Ionic. Ionic. Right? Those are the two most common uh, two types of bonds which are common. So two types of bonds. Ionic, and then we have covalent also. So we're going to be focusing on uh, covalent bonds because semiconductors form covalent bonds. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, so a silicon forms covalent bonds with uh, with four other silicon atoms around it. So let's put our um, let's put another silicon atom here, silicon atom here, silicon atom here, silicon atom here. This one has four atoms around it. This one has sorry, not four atoms, four electrons. Four electrons around this guy. Four electrons around this guy, and four electrons around this guy. Can everyone see this okay? Big enough? All right, good. So what happens in a covalent bond? Someone tell me, what happens in a covalent bond? They share electrons. That's correct. So this neighboring silicon atom here, it shares um, one of the electrons with, with this one. And so what we do is we just draw a circle around here to show that they're being shared. All right, and this happens with each of the four other um, surrounding silicon atoms. All right, so now how many electrons does it have in its outer shell now? Eight. And it's eight, so it's happy. All right, so this is a chemically stable structure for silicon. Okay, this is exactly what carbon does too, by the way. Okay, carbon is also a column four element. All right, this is how diamond is formed. Okay, carbon forms... Uh, bond each carbon atom forms a bond with four other carbon atoms around it. Silicon does the same thing; it forms a bond with four other uh, silicon atoms around it. Does anyone remember from chemistry what this is called when a, when an atom forms uh, um, for a bond with four other atoms around it? Covalent bond. Starts with a T. Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. Exactly. So this is what we're calling a tetrahedral. Tetrahedral bonding. So uh, now, if we remember the the physical aspects of the tetrahedral bond, 
If we draw the same bond structure in 3D, it'll look something like this. You have a silicon atom here. So I'm drawing this in 3D right now. This was a 2D dot diagram that I drew earlier, but now I'm drawing a 3D diagram here. Okay, you can see that this looks sort of like the legs of a tripod. And there's one up here, and one up here, one up here, one up here. Now the angle between um, uh, this, the angle between these guys is 109 degrees, and it's 109 degrees. If you take any two legs of the tripod, there's four legs of this tripod. Okay, the top one and the three bottom ones. They all have an equal angle between them. Does anyone remember why that happens? Why do they all have an equal angle? Very good, very good. Yeah, there's this thing called steric hindrance. Electrons repel each other, right? So there are there are electrons. So there are electrons here. There's electrons here. There's electrons here, and then there's also electrons here. These electrons tend to repel each other, so they push each other as far apart as possible, and that's why you end up having that 109 degree angle. That there, that's the the angle at which all four of those legs are spread as far apart as possible. So this is the chemical structure of silicon. And if, you know, of course, you know, this atom is also connected to four other atoms around this. So it looks something like this. All the silicon atoms are connected to four other silicon atoms around it. Uh, so uh, any questions so far? Okay, main points here. These are covalent bonds that are forming between adjacent silicon atoms. Each silicon atom is bound to four other silicon atoms around it, tetrahedral bonding, the bond angle between these. I mean, that's not that important for this class, but if you go into a more detailed class on quantum mechanics, then those types of bond angles are, in fact, very important. So, you know, I've started drawing this. You can see here that I've started drawing what this looks like here, what a lattice of silicon atoms will look like. But what we're going to find out later is that it, the the lattice structure forms something called the diamond lattice, which we'll, we'll talk about in just a few slides. So the elemental uh, semiconductors form uh, uh, transistors and other, uh, the elemental semiconductors, like those are examples of silicon, carbon, germanium, column four elements. They form bonds with uh, similar types of atoms. Uh, and this is the most common type of uh, semiconductor used. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because silicon is a very abundant element on Earth. And also, we've built up all the infrastructure, the manufacturing infrastructure, for making things with silicon. Another type of semiconductor material is, uh, is what's called the 3-5 material. These are used in high-speed devices and devices requiring the emission and absorption of light. Uh, with elemental semiconductors like silicon, they are often what's called indirect band gap semiconductors. Uh, by contrast, some of the 3-5 semiconductors are called direct band gap semiconductors. So direct band gap semiconductors can actually uh, emit light. So what are examples of semiconductors that emit light that you know of? LEDs. LEDs, right? LEDs are made up of uh, materials like gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, indium phosphide. Okay. Uh, another example is lasers. Lasers are actually made up of semiconductors. Okay, and so uh, uh, gallium aluminum arsenide, I think, is used for red lasers. Different materials used for green lasers, and so on. <coughs> So when we're talking about 3-5 materials, we're looking at, we take one, one type of atom from column 3 of the periodic table, and then we take another type from column 5 of the uh, periodic table. Uh, and which combinations work? It, 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 people have done a lot of experiments and studies on you know, how, how can you create uh, materials using combinations of 3 and 5 materials. One of the things that they found is that you can't take a really small column three atom like boron, and combine it with a very large column th uh, column five atom like Sb. Remember, like things at the top of the periodic table are small atoms, 
things at the bottom of the periodic table are much larger atoms. So you actually have to use atoms that are similar in size so that the lattices can form properly. So uh, one common material is gallium and arsenide. That's probably the, the most common 3-5 uh, semiconductor. That's here, the gallium arsenide here. Uh, gallium arsenide is used in um, infrared emitters, infrared remote um, detectors. Um, the most common example is a remote control on your TV. When you hit that button on your TV remote, it sends an infrared signal. There's an infrared emitter, and that infrared emitter is sending the light signal to your TV. We can't see infrared, so it's invisible to us, but it's basically a light signal. If you were to take a piece of metal and put it in front of the remote control, it won't work anymore because it'll reflect the light. So uh, what does a 3-5 material look in terms of a um, uh, in terms of the atomic structure? Well, uh, it could look something like this. Let's say you have arsenide. Arsenide ha is a column 5 element, so it has 5 electrons in its outer shell. And each arsenide atom is surrounded by 4 gallium atoms. Gallium atoms are column 3 elements. All right. So in a in a um, compound semiconductor, as you go through the lattice, it's all, the atoms are always alternating. From each arsenide atom is surrounded by four gallium atoms, and each gallium atom is surrounded by four arsenide atoms. So let's see a little bit how this works. Gallium atoms have three electrons in its outer shell. Yes, gallium is in column three, so they have three electrons in its outer shell. Let me redraw this here. So what the bonding that you can see that happens here is that gallium will contribute one atom here, gallium will contribute another atom here, gallium will contribute another atom here. Now in this third bond, you can see that uh, this particular gallium atom will not contribute an electron here. The arsenide atom will contribute both electrons to this uh, bond. Okay? So the key point is right here. Uh, the arsenide atom has five electrons in its outer shell, so it's actually supplying both electrons to one of the covalent bonds around it. All right, so, uh, and this gallium atom is surrounded by four ar other arsenides. If you draw that out, you can actually figure out that the math, the math of it works. All the bonds, like, you'll still end up having eight electrons in the outer shell for all the bond, all the bonding, and there'll be alternating gallium and arsenide atoms. So that's how a compound semiconductor works. Uh, the uh, tetrahedral bonding is the same. Uh, each atom is surrounded by four other atoms, so they form that 109 degree bond angle. Uh, no problem there. The only difference is that you have alternating atoms instead of the same atom. Uh, well, ga ga uh, compound semiconductors are a little bit more expensive to make than uh, uh, elemental semiconductors. As you can imagine, making a material that has alternating atoms in the lattice requires a little bit more process control. They have to be made under more uh, uh, controlled conditions. So for that reason, uh, things that are made up of uh, compound semiconductors traditionally were more expensive than silicon. Actually, they still are more expensive than silicon. Silicon you can, is pretty dirt cheap to work with if you consider it. You can buy microprocessors for like five dollars, you know, less than, less than uh, buying a, a half gallon of milk at Whole Foods. So things, but uh, uh, when you're talking about three, five semiconductors, they, they cost a little bit more. Uh, the advantage of 3-5 semiconductors is that sometimes they can do additional functions. For example, I mentioned that they can emit light. They can, uh, they can serve as good light detectors. Silicon detect light, can detect light too, but certain types of compound semiconductors will be sensitive to wavelengths that silicon is not. Silicon can detect visible light really well, but uh, compound se semiconductors, can uh, certain types can detect infrared light, they can detect um, ultraviolet light, and so on.
But the biggest thing is that certain types of compound semiconductors can emit light. Okay, so LEDs and lasers, they're not made with silicon. They're made from some more exotic materials. They used to be more expensive before, but now you can see that you know, things like LEDs are also becoming quite, uh, quite affordable as we, have, as we build up the manufacturing capacity to work with those types of uh, compound materials. So 3-5 uh, materials are used in high-speed devices and uh, devices requiring the emission and absorption of light. Uh, gallium arsenide is also used in high-speed uh, uh, amplifiers. So when you need, when when you need to build detectors uh, or uh, a wireless uh, wireless modules that operate at very high frequencies, sometimes they use things like gallium arsenide instead of silicon. More expensive, but uh, gallium arsenide is faster than silicon. Uh, other types of semiconductor materials, there's the two six materials, so fluorescent materials such as those used on your television screen, old old school television screens. We're not talking about the LED screens now. We're talking about the old school ones that were, you had an electron tube, a cathode ray tube that was shooting electrons into a screen. The screen actually had a phosphor coating on them. And the phosphor coating, like when the electrons hit it, they lit up. So that's another type of uh, semiconductor material. Uh, these are used in fluorescent material. So some of you have uh, watches with glow-in-the-dark hands. Uh, the, the, the watch dial actually has glow-in-the-dark um, things on it. Right, so those are phosphor. Those are typically made from phosphor materials, and some of those are two six semiconductors. So you take a column two semiconductor, and you and you take a column six. I'm oh, sorry, you take a column two element, and then you take a column uh, six element, and you combine them together. So common uh, two six compounds: um, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, uh, zinc sulfide, zinc selenide. These are all referred to as the two six compounds. We won't spend too much time talking about those in this class. I would say 90% of what we're going to do has to do with elemental semiconductors, silicon, and germanium. Now, within here, uh, silicon, as I said, the most common element, uh, you can form nice semiconductors with it. If we look at other uh, elemental semiconductors, carbon. Carbon can be used as a semiconductor material. Um, diamond, right? Crystalline. Carbon is basically diamond. There are folks and there are agencies that are sponsoring uh, research into making diamond-based electronics. Uh, diamond has a, a, a property called a band gap, which is much larger than silicon is. So diamond is much less conductive than silicon is. However, one of the properties of diamond having a large band gap, it can be used in higher temperature applications. So there are some type of uh, applications, really high temperature sensors, uh, where you may be, you might use materials like carbon. But it, has, it hasn't become very popular yet. Uh, germanium, if we look at down here on the part of the uh, periodic table, germanium is a column four element and it is used in semiconductors. It actually has a smaller band gap than silicon. Germanium is used in high, um, uh, high speed microprocessors, high performance microprocessors. Uh, the only rise, the reason why it's not more widespread is because germanium is less abundant, less abundantly available than silicon is, so it's more expensive to work with. Uh, but germanium has a higher mobility. Carriers move faster through germanium than they do through silicon, so it's, it is actually a higher performance material. One last thing I'd like to throw in here is that uh, you can actually make semiconductors by combining two column four elements. So if we go back up to this diagram here, let's say we just replace the silicon and we just put germanium here. Germanium is also a column four element, right? So, you know, it works out fine. You can have, uh, you can have semiconductors which are called SIGI, silicon germanium which are made of combinations of silicon and germanium. SIGI was used uh, for a lot of high-performance microprocessors because the germanium atoms are different size than the silicon atoms. So you might have something like this where um, you have four large atoms like this. I'm sorry. You might have four atoms like this. These are the silicon atoms. And then you have a much larger atom in between. You're alternating large and small atoms. What that does, it creates strain in the lattice. 
in the lattice structure because you have a mismatch between the size of the atoms. It turns out that this strain in the lattice actually changes the mobility, how fast electrons can move through the material. So silicon germanium turned out was also a high performance material. Okay, there are people who dedicate their entire careers to studying how you can make different types of atomic structures, different types of semiconductor materials, and then they spend their career studying their properties to see if they can come up with new higher performance materials. It, it's a very challenging uh, uh, thing because it requires a lot of patience in terms of how you're going to manufacture it, how you do the crystal deposition, how, you know, the right temperatures, and the, you know, um, uh, uh, using the right thermal budget, annealing your materials to make sure that they that that you don't get defects. It's it's a very big area of of research, how to just make these different types of crystal structures. Um, okay, good. Let's take a short break, and then we'll start with the uh, diamond lattice here. Yes, please. So yes, we were going to start. Uh, we were going to talk about the diamond lattice here. Okay, so we just finished talking about the uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the crystal structures and the different types of um, the elemental versus compound semiconductors. So now we can talk about what's called the diamond lattice. This is the unit cell for uh, for silicon. So, you know, here we were talking about different examples of unit cells. The reason I put these up here is because these are the simplest types, and they're, they're easy to visualize, they're easy to understand. But silicon is, uh, you know, crystalline silicon is none of these unit cells. The unit cell for, for silicon is called the diamond lattice. Okay. Now, another point I want to make, because this is often a point of confusion, is that sometimes people say, well, each silicon atom is bounded to bound to four other silicon atoms around it. All right, going back to this diagram here, why isn't that the unit cell? The answer is is because it's the smallest. The unit cell is the smallest repeating unit. Okay, this is repeating, yes, but you can't just put these right next to each other. Right, that's not what the structure looks like. Right? You have to literally be able to stack them next to each other, like the, like the cube. Right? So these unit cells often have the shape of a cube because cubes can easily be stacked next to one another. So this is what the crystal structure of silicon looks like. Let me first point out what, um, what they have, uh, you know, the things that, that we have in common here. Uh, keep in mind that each one of these silicon atoms is bound to four other silicon atoms around it. So let's take this black one in the middle here, okay? So this black silicon atom is bound to four other silicon atoms around it, which are also in black, okay? The reason why these four atoms are in black is to help you see what the structure looks like. So we have one central atom here, and then we have four atoms around it. And you can see that the angle between each one of these bonds, the bonds are represented by the stick, so this is a ball and stick model. The ball is the nucleus. The stick is the bonds. There's about a 109 degree angle between each one of these legs. And you can see that the, the legs are um, spread apart. And it sort of looks like a tripod Okay, with, with the legs spread out quite wide. Now, uh, four of these atoms make up just a portion of the unit cell. So you have one silicon atom here. There's four silicon atoms around it. And then next to it, we have all these other ones, too. You can see that each silicon atom, whether it's this one, this one, or what have you, is bound to four other silicon atoms around it. Now, um, 
this is the smallest repeating unit. So this is the unit cell. This is called the diamond lattice. Notice that the ones on the edge, the silicon atoms on the edge, are um, uh, uh, they. You know, you can see that they don't have all the bonds complete, right? And that that makes sense because you know the, some of those bonds actually go outside of the lattice, so they don't show those here. All right. So uh, uh, like the other lattices, this has uh, it's a cube. The edge of the cube has a length a. Does anyone know, remember what the a is? What the definition of a? Lattice constant. Lattice constant. Exactly. <clears throat> now, uh, when you initially look at this structure, you're going to think, well, okay, that looks pretty complicated. Sometimes it's helpful for us to have a way to remember what this thing looks like. Okay. At the atomic level, it's every silicon atom is bound to four other atoms around it, and then you have that bond angle. But in terms of the crystal structure, something that will make it easier for you to remember is that um, they are um, two FCC lattices displaced by one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. That may or may not be easy for you to remember. I'll, show, I'll describe to you a different way in just a second. Um, let me make sure I have these points covered first. Uh, silicon and, and um, silicon and other elemental semiconductors form a diamond lattice. Each atom is connected to four others. Um, you can think about it as two FCC lattices <coughs> displaced by this much. And then there are these uh, models here. So. Um, let me see if we can open one of the models so that you can take another close look at it. So I just downloaded this software today, so let's see if it works. Uh, there we go. So this software is called FreeWRL. You can download it, install it on your computers, and you can also play with these lattices if it's helpful for you. Some, some of you may get it right away, and for some of you, you may need to actually open the software up, move it around, and just get an idea of uh, what, this, um, what this thing can do, or what, what the atomic structure looks like. So if we look here, for example, you notice that each silicon atom has four other silicon atoms around it, and as a whole, you have this unit cell, which has, uh, we can count up how many atoms there are. We'll do that in just a second. And this is what the, the unit cell looks like. So since we have this open, let's do this right now. Uh, the way that you can remember it, this is the point I was getting to a second ago. The way that you can remember what a diamond lattice looks like is, first of all, um, you can jot this down, you start off with um, a, uh, uh, a face-centered cubic lattice. Okay, what is a face-centered cubic lattice? It has four. It has eight corner atoms, and how many face atoms does it have? Six. Six. All right. Again, face-centered cubic lattice means that you have eight corner atoms. So one of these guys. Okay, this is a corner atom. There's eight corners of a cube, so you have eight atoms, one on each corner of the cube. Next, you have six face atoms. A face atom is this guy right here. Okay. On the center of each face of the cube, you have one atom there. There are six faces in a cube, so you have six face atoms. That's the face-centered cubic lattice. Now, the diamond lattice has an additional four atoms inside of it. This is the part where it's really helpful if you're, if you're, able, if you're able to open this up and take a look at it yourself. You can see that inside this lattice, we have one, two, um, and then we have another central atom here and another central atom here. Okay. Now, when you turn this thing around, one of the things you have to be careful about is that you know this guy here, for example, this looks like an internal atom, but it's really, if we turn it around, we'll see that it's actually a face atom. Okay. So when you look at this model, you'll actually find, if you study it, you'll see that there's four internal atoms. Okay. I'm going to close this down because we're done looking at it. Um, let's see where the PowerPoint. There we go. And if we look at this guy also, we'll see that there are four internal atoms. This one here, ah, this one here, 
then we have this one here, this one here, and uh, this guy over here. Uh, how's another way to describe the four atoms? Let's see. Let me get the pen out. Let's... I can draw this far here. So let's say we have, uh, where are the central atoms? Let me just redraw the FCC lattice one part at a time so you can kind of get the, the diamond lattice one part at a time so you can get an idea of where those atoms are. All right, so this is, this is the cube. Now the most straightforward part is the eight corner atoms. So we'll draw those in there. So eight corner atoms, and then in green what I'll do is I'll draw the, the face atoms, one at the center of each face. Six faces in a cube, all right. Then we have uh, 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 the center atoms. Now the center atoms is the one I want to point out. If we were to divide this cube into eight smaller cubes. So if we go like this, all right, so I've sort of broken this up into um, eight smaller cubes. So this would be one. Sorry. This would be one. This cube here would be two. This cube here would be three. And this cube here would be four. This cube here would be five. This one is six. This one is seven. And this one is eight. We've broken up the cube into sm eight smaller cubes. Now, where the internal atoms lie, there's one at the center of one and three. There's a body atom here. Uh, sorry, there's an atom in the center of this uh, subcube. There's an atom in the middle of this subcube. All right, so notice that these two subcubes are, are uh, 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 diagonal to one another. One and three are diagonal to one another. And then on the bottom, we also pick two that are diagonal to one another, this one and this one. All right, so in this case, it's six and seven. Now, I don't know if, that, if, if that's helpful to you to understand in this manner. So you have opposite corners, opposite uh, subcubes within the main cube that have the center atoms in it. Uh, that can be helpful to you. If it's more helpful for you to go back to this drawing and just look carefully through this, then I suggest you do that as well. But you have four internal atoms, four atoms inside the body of the cube. Uh, and that's what the uh, diamond lattice looks like. So uh, any questions on that? Okay. The zinc blend lattice is, uh, is identical to the diamond lattice. This is just a terminology. Okay. The zinc blend lattice really is just the same thing as the diamond lattice, except you have alternating atoms. So this would be the, what type of semiconductor would have the zinc blend lattice? Gallium arsenide is an example. More generally, just the compound semiconductors. So compound semiconductors have alternating atoms. So they form what's called the zinc blend lattice. The structure is the same. You have the eight corner atoms. You have the, the six face atoms, the four center atoms. The only difference is that the atoms are alternating. In this particular one is gallium arsenide. You have like, you know, the, um, the two types of atoms are shown in, in yellow and blue respectively. There's also a, a virtual reality model for this that you can download as well. Okay. We're going to just do one, uh, one problem on calculating volume density. Uh, so the question is how can we calculate the volume density of uh, silicon atoms 
in crystalline silicon, given that the lattice constant is 5.4 angstroms. So we're going to do this problem in class. You will also have a problem like this in your homework. So uh, my suggestion to you is that in class, do these problem, uh, do do the problems, and make sure that uh, you know if you have any, if you try them. If you have any questions, you can ask them in class. This will save you time outside of class to do it. So a simple example here, we're going to calculate the volume density of silicon atoms in crystalline silicon, given that the lattice constant is 5.4 angstroms. Now, what is volume density? Volume density is uh, volume density is the uh, number of atoms. Oops. Number of atoms per centimeter cubed. All right, so what I'd like you to figure out, volume density is the number of atoms. This is the way that you figure out. Number of atoms per unit cell. Oh, my gosh. Sorry. Unit cell divided by the volume of the unit cell. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so I'd like you to try this problem, uh, figure out the number of atoms per unit cell, the volume of the unit cell. The only tricky thing here is uh, when you're calculating the number of atoms per unit cell, you have to consider how many atoms are shared between individual or between adjacent lattice, adjacent unit cells. The rest of this is obviously it's pretty easy. So how do you deal with the atoms that are being shared between adjacent unit cells? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So let's all try that. Now I'll give you a few minutes to work on it, and then we'll. Uh, then we'll go over it together as a class. So just take another a cu couple minutes so everyone has a chance to think about this a little bit. And uh, <laughs> all right, ideas. Do you have ideas? Eight over. Yes. Okay. So let's let's go over that. Let's go over that. Um, so we have. Uh, uh, let's see. Ah, go away. Uh, so the the volume density is the number of atoms per unit cell 
divided by the volume of the unit cell. Okay, so the number of atoms, what we have to do is we have to consider that there are um, eight corner atoms, right? Eight corner atoms, we have six face atoms, and then four internal atoms, right? So uh, when we're considering the number of atoms per unit cell, we have to take eight and we have to multiply that by what? One eight. Right. We take the six face atoms, we multiply that by one half because it's shared between two unit cells, and then we take uh, four internal atoms, and what, what do we multiply that with? Exactly, just one. And then we divide it by the volume of the unit cell, which is uh, 2.5. Angstroms, one angstrom, let's put this down here, one angstrom is equal to 10 to the negative 8 centimeters. So for this class, we'll be using centimeters as the length unit. This is just the convention of everyone in the solid state field. We just tend to use centimeters. So it's 2.5 times 10 to the negative 8, and this will be uh, cubed. Oh, is it 5.4? Sorry about that. Okay, now uh, again, just going over this, uh, you know, this is a pretty simple concept here, but you can see that if you have two adjacent unit cells, for example, if you had this, um, this is one of the face atoms here, right? This is shared by two adjacent unit cells, so half, half of the atom is going to be in this unit cell, and half of the atom is going to be in the next unit cell. So that's another way you can kind of think about it. So these face atoms here, six face atoms, that's multiplied by one half. It's shared by two unit cells. The corner atoms is divided by one and multiplied by one eighth because each corner atom is shared by eight unit cells. All right, so this is a it comes out to be a pretty easy problem. So eight times one eighth is one, six times one half three, plus four. So it's eight divided by 5.4, so 8 atoms, divided by 5.4 times 10 to the negative 8 uh, centimeters, centimeters cubed. Um, it, it's, minus, it's minus 8 because, yeah, right, an angstrom is 10 to the negative 8 centimeters. An angstrom is 10 to the negative 10 meters, 10 to the negative 8 centimeters. Uh, I don't know if someone with a calculator can help me out here. One point five seven. No, that's just a, it's, and oh, okay. Five times uh, ten to the twenty-two. Five times ten to the twenty-two, and the units is atoms per centimeter cubed. Okay, this is a, a basic calculation of volume density. That's a lot of atoms per centimeter cubed, right? And just to give you an idea of like how small atoms are. So the um, the volume density of atoms determines a lot of properties. You know how you know how conductive a material is, like um, you know what the weight of it is. There's a lot of different things. So that's one of the things that material scientists tend to do. This is not a class on material science, so we won't be spending too much time on these volume density calculations. Maybe just one simple one for a quiz or, or a test or something like that. It's just so just so you get an idea of the structure of the atoms. So then uh, we can start talking about, oh, let's, sorry, back up for a second. Any, any questions on how, how to calculate volume density? Okay. Uh, okay. So the next part we talk about is the, uh, the planes in a crystal lattice. Yeah. There's uh, three families of planes in the crystal lattice. There's the... Uh, 100 family of planes, the 110 family of planes, and the 111 family of planes. Okay. Uh, if we break up the uh, 
the silicon, uh, the, the diamond lattice, the unit cell that we just talked about. We can break up that unit cell and we can look at the different faces. We can cut out two-dimensional sections of that unit cell and look at what the atomic density is on one of the planes, for example. You know, for example, you know, let's say we have the, uh, the entire diamond lattice. We saw a picture of the diamond lattice earlier, right? But we only look at, let's say we only look at this face of the cube. What would the atomic structure there look like? It would look like four atoms like this and with an atom in the middle, right? So we're cutting out a 2D section. And just like you can calculate volume densities, you can also calculate area densities. Volume densities means the number of atoms per centimeter cubed. That's for a three-dimensional problem. And then you could also do a two-dimensional problem like we show here, where um, I ask you to calculate the area density of atoms along one of these two-dimensional surfaces. So in this case, we have four corner atoms, one, one atom in the middle. The adjacent cells would look like this. You see what I'm getting at here? So in this, if we want to do a calculation like this, one of the corner atoms, in the case when we we're doing volume density, each atom was shared between eight adjacent unit cells, right? In the two-dimensional problem, if I'm asking you to calculate area density, how many unit cells share this atom? Four, exactly, in the two-dimensional problem. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so I could ask you to calculate the area density of atoms along different, uh, what's called different crystal planes, different cutouts of the crystal lattice. And there's three different types of unit, uh, the crystal planes, which are you know commonly used in silicon. One of them is the 100 plane, which is down here. The 100 plane, forget about Miller indices. We're not going to be going into the details of them in this class. We never seem to have time to go. Uh, you know, we're going to skip over that. But the 100 plane family of planes, which is here. Just keep in mind the notation here. These curly braces means the 100 family of planes. And the way that you can remember that, I'm just going to define it, is that any face, any face of the cube is considered a 100 plane. Any face of the cube. So there's six faces of the cube. Any faces of the cube is considered part of the 100 family of planes. And the atomic distribution on each one of those faces is symmetric, right? So they all look the same. Next, there's the one one zero family of planes. Now that's shown in um, that's shown in green here. Okay, that's this one here. The one one zero family of planes is where you take you cut a diagonal across the middle of the cube, and then you create a plane that way. So that's this green part here. Okay. The 110 family of planes has a different atomic structure, but that's going to be one of your homework problems. You're going to be asked to calculate what the atomic uh, density is, the area density, along the 110 family of planes. So the 110 family of planes means uh, cutting a diagonal across the, um, a face. So you're cutting, you cut a diagonal across one face here. Then you cut a diagonal across the opposite face, and those two lines, and you draw the plane that way. Okay, that's how you draw a one one zero plane, and there's many of those as well, right? In the crystal lattice, you can figure out how many different one one zero planes there are. The one 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 family of planes, all right? That's the third one here. The 111 family of planes is shown in red. One example is shown here. Now, um, uh, if you want to jot this down, it's helpful, but it's also going to be on the recording. The way that you make a 111 plane is that you take, you cut a diagonal across one face of a cube, or one of the faces of the cube. Then you cut a diagonal across the adjacent face, this one. Then you cut a diagonal across a third adjacent face. So if I were to rephrase that, take three adjacent faces of the cube, draw diagonals across each of them in a way so that they're connected. So you can see that this diagonal, this diagonal, 
this diagonal, they're all when they connect, they're connected to each other. Draw a plane based on those three lines, and you'll get the one one zero. You get a one 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 plane. Now, what do you notice about this one 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 plane compared to these other two planes? Smaller area. It's a triangle instead of a rectangle, right? So when you calculate area density, you're going to have to consider the area of the triangle instead of the area of a rectangle. Right? And um, you can <coughs> do a thought problem to yourself and figure out how many 111 planes do I have in, uh, in, uh, uh, in a cube like this. And think about all the possible ones. I think I had that as an extra credit question once on a test. So these are the type of things that you can think about. Now, this being said, from a practical standpoint, the most common types of uh, wafers, we're, we're just jumping ahead here, the most common types of wafers are what's called the 100 wafers. What that means is that um, uh, we, silicon is three-dimensional. Oops. <coughs> Let's delete this here. Silicon is a three-dimensional material, but a silicon wafer, we have to cut it. Yeah, silicon wafer looks something like this. All right, it's one of these disks. We'll talk about how we make it in just a second. But uh, when we cut the wafer, we have to cut it along one of the surfaces. So from this diagram, if we were to cut, if we were to cut the silicon along here like this then we'd end up getting one, the 100 zero, zero plane along the surface of the wafer. We'd have a certain atomic density. If we were to cut it this way instead, if we decide we want to cut diagonally across here like this, we're going to get a different family of planes, right? We're going to get the 110 or the 111 family of planes, depending on how we cut it. So how we cut the silicon determines how many atoms the atomic distribution on the surface of the wafer. Turns out that's very important to the you know, properties of the wafer. That being said, 90% of the wafers that are made are 100 wafers, meaning they have the 100 surface exposed. All right. Now, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to try to wrap this module up. And uh, so I'd like to talk to you about... Uh, Silica, silicon semiconductor manufacturing from sand to microchips. This is a nice little thing, um, a nice little video that um, Intel had. Let's see if we can watch this. There we go. Student loans. Is that a sour point for many of you? <laughs> All right. I don't know what's going on with the sound here. So you start with sand. Then you take that. Uh, the si silicon comes from sand. Let me let me back up here for a second. The sound isn't working, so I'm just going to explain it as we go. Silicon is made from sand, so we're very abundant on Earth. Okay. Uh, you take this sand is silica. From silica, you can extract silicon, and you can do that by melting it. It's melted down at, at very high temperatures. Okay, and that uh, it's put into a crucible that's held at high temperatures. From that crucible, let's, let's uh, I don't want to go too fast here. From the crucible, you can create this thing called an ingot. All right? That is one big solid piece of silicon, like this. The ingots are usually about, you know, they can be, a cylinder is about, you know, as tall as a person and, and quite wide, actually. This is crystalline silicon. Okay, it's by making it in a crucible, you can use this something called the Trotsky process. If if the silicon is heated up and it's it's twisted in a, in a very uniform way, 
then what comes out of it is nicely uniform crystalline silicon with low defects. This is a very important part of semiconductor manufacturing. Moving on, the silicon is then sliced into wafers. Now, as we just talked about, we're slicing along the 100 plane. You end up with these things called wafers. How many of you have you seen this before? Seen these discs? Let's have a show of hands. Okay, a few of you have seen it. Okay, um, this is a silicon wafer. This is uh, it, it's it's a disc. This is where the semiconductor. This is where your microchips are made, starting with their silicon. All right. Now we're going through a process called photolithography. We're going to go into the details of photolithography and all this stuff much later. This is an optical process where you actually use patterns of light to define where your transistors are going to go, where your logic gates are going to go. All right, there's special tools that are used to do all this. Now you can see that this, uh, if you zoom in, you can see each one of these like individual um, transistors being formed. This part is, is illustrating the fact that you also put metal lines to connect your transistors together to one another. Then you take the wafer and you saw it up, use something called a dicing saw, and you cut it into small squares. Each one of these small squares is a microprocessor. So the thing inside your computer is just one of those small squares that are cut out from this big wafer. Each wafer has hundreds or thousands or in even some cases tens of thousands of microprocessors on there. So you can imagine how much a wafer costs by the time the processing is done. Sometimes these wafers are worth more than a million dollars. Each wafer is worth more than a million dollars by the time it's done. Now, if we just back up here for a second. Um, this goes into the next part of the process. After dicing it up, you take one of these things with like just a vacuum tool, and vacuum pick in place. All right, it's going to grab this one, you'll see. This microprocessor then gets put into like um, a package to help keep it cool. Right. Well, it's important that you dissipate the heat or else the microprocessor will overheat. Then this, uh, this microprocessor is tested to make sure for quality control, and that's what's sold as your Intel multi-core processor. Yes? Why do they make um, disk circles? Why do they just make them all squares if they're going to become squares eventually? Good question. Why, the question is, why do they make them in circles? Well, a, a couple things. If you saw this process here, the Trolsky process, they actually rotate, they rotate the cylinder. Any type of process when you have rotation involved, it's much easier to make cylinders instead of, uh, instead of squares. The second process you see here is something called photolithography, where they actually spin coat something on it. What they do is they put the wafer down on something that spins it at high speeds, and then they take an eyedropper, and they drop a solution on the surface of the wafer. If you have a, a round wafer, a cylindrical wafer, the thing spreads much more uniformly than if you had a square one. So the answer, the short answer to your question is it's much more reliable to manufacture circular um, disks. Right? Um, I, I don't have time to go into all the details of this right now. I'm just showing you a glimpse of it so that you can get an appreciation for it. Uh, we may not get through all this material. We'll, we might come back to this in just the last few slides in a second. Um, I want you to get appreciate the process that this, you have this uh, process silicon. Um, it goes from silicon, you create an ingot. You cut up that ingot into small disks called wafers. There's a 26-step process called the CMOS process where each one of these wafers is you, you create all the transistors and um, metal interconnects on the surface of the wafer. So each one of these wafers then has 100 or so microprocessors, maybe thousands of microprocessors, depending on how big the processor is. This is cut up into small squares. They're packaged up and that each one of those is a microprocessor. It's an amazing process. It took... It took 20 or 30 years to perfect, but it really, this is, if you want to ask, like, what has really driven the fact that electronics are so pervasive in our lives from the point we wake up in the morning to our, uh, to our, our um, cell phone alarm clocks to, like, we're talking all day and sending messages all day. We're using computers all the time. We hardly use paper anymore. Everything is done by microprocessors, and one of the reasons why that's been possible is because this manufacturing process that you see here on this slide has been perfected over the last uh, I would say more than 20 years, probably the last like 30 or um, 50 years, uh, where it really started, where it's, where it's really like matured and, and gotten to the point where it's pretty much all electronics are made this way.
We still have a few slides left. I guess we'll we'll have to cover those um, on the next class period. So uh, uh, I will see you all on Thursday. I posted on Blackboard. I posted the um, the schedule for everyone's presentations. So there will be three presentations uh, because one of the guys who was supposed to go today he emailed me and said it was not possible. So we're going to do three of them on Thursday. We won't have an exam, uh, a quiz on Thursday, but we probably will next Tuesday. So keep that in mind. All right, see you all later.